Thank you, everyone. My name is Wayne Lamar. I'm the director of the Athletic Training Education Program here at UNE, and I want to welcome you. Uh, before I forget, those of you that are uh, would like to earn CEU credits for this evening's lecture, please see Chris uh, here in the front. Professor Rizzo is here with the uh, information. There are CME uh, evaluation forms and uh, reporting forms out on the table directly outside the double doors, so please make sure you do that before you leave. Uh, and again, welcome to the 2012 Harold Elfon Sports Medicine Lecture sponsored by UNE's Athletic Training and Physical Therapy Student Clubs, our Westbrook College of Health Professions. Uh, my name is Wayne Lamar, and I'm the director of the Athletic Training Education Program here. That was supposed to be funny, because I did it before. Okay. Oh. Got it? Okay. <laughs> Come on. <clears throat> This lecture series recognizes Mr. Alphonse's extraordinary role in helping to strengthen the University of New England and advance our educational mission. Given Mr. Alphonse's passion for sports, his many generous gifts in support of Maine athletes and athletics, and his commitment to training Maine students as sports medicine professionals, this is an appropriate lecture series to honor him. And what more fitting place to hold this event than here in the Alphonse Center for Health Sciences? This building was named for Mr. Alphonse when it was completed in 1996 to recognize a $2.5 million gift uh, the largest donation in UNE's history at that time. Last year's, as you all know, the legacy of the Harold L. Fund has once again transformed UNE with a $10 million commitment from the foundation in support of athletics and healthcare education. Again, the largest gift in our history. The L. Fund Forum, housing an ice hockey arena, varsity athletics performance courts, a state-of-the-art fitness center, athletic training room, and the new home for the departments of athletics and exercise and sport performance, yay, that's us, as well as the Biddeford campus location for the Westbrook College of Health Professions Academic Dean's Office, will open in October of this year. UNE is planning a series of special events to mark this historic event. Uh, please stay tuned for more information and invitations. UNE has become a leader in the field of interprofessional education and in sports medicine is a perfect example of this as it touches numerous disciplines studied here at UNE. Applied exercise science, athletic training, nursing, osteopathic medicine, physical therapy, physician assistant, and sport management. Tonight's topic, anterior cruciate ligament rupture and re-injury, what puts an athlete at risk, also affects many disciplines and has been widely covered in the medical literature and media over the past several decades. Many of you here this evening may have suffered this season-ending injury yourself or know a friend, relative, or teammate who has. I'm just curious, how many of you here have actually suffered an ACL rupture? Raise your hand if you have. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Our featured speaker, Dr. Timothy Hewitt, uh, is an internationally recognized expert on this topic. We're very fortunate to have him with us tonight. I want to give special thanks to our sponsors, of course, uh, as well as uh, Sarah Hutchins, Ann Manzo, and, and Professor Chris Rizzo for the help of the event. And at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Aaron Hartigan from UNE's Physical Therapy Department, who was also instrumental in making this happen, to introduce our speaker. Dr. Hartigan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So uh, it's great to see the house full. So um, before I introduce Tim, I will introduce you all to how Tim was introduced to me. So I first um, started, uh, well, I first learned of Tim's, uh, Dr. Hewitt's research when he started investigating whether turf versus grass fields were um, gonna impact the incidence of injury. And when he was investigating that data, he looked at ACL injuries and started to see how often they were incurring in females. And so he found that, in fact, with time um, controlled, time of playing on the field controlled, that females were, in fact, at a greater incidence of injury compared to males. So that was the first that I heard of him trailblazing and, and finding very important information. And, and that basically was uh, the, the media took hold of that. And I still didn't know who Tim was, but I certainly was aware of his research. And then with the inquisitive mind that he has, he continued to trailblaze to figure out, well, why is this happening? And uh, not only what is provocative for positions, but how can we better treat this? And he has so, and then when I went to get my PhD in biomechanics and, and did research in ACL uh, injury, then it was certainly aware to me, because I bet you more than half of the articles that I read came out of um, Tim Hewitt's lab. He is a phenomenal researcher. He has a very, very inquisitive mind, and um, he's a very busy man. He is the director 
of research at The Ohio State University, and he holds several positions as a professor um, within the Department of Physiology and Cell Biology, Orthopedic Surgery, Family Medicine, Biomechanical Engineering, and the School of Allied Health Professions. He still works at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, where um, he was first made famous of uh, the basically making it known that females were at greater risk than um, males. And he also holds a position at Kentucky. There's other um, schools in D Dayton, uh, Cleveland Clinic. He's just a very, very busy man, and he's leaving here to travel six, to visit six countries in a month. So uh, I feel very fortunate to have the support of the student organizations and everyone else that, that made this happen. And when I asked Dr. Hewitt to come here, um, he very quickly was like, yes, absolutely. So um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hewitt, and um, hopefully we'll give him a nice warm welcome. It started out in these studies that I'm going to tell you about tonight as research subjects. When they were 15 years old, we went out to a school we screened them, and they were indicated as very high risk. This was prior to the time that we had interventions over 15 years ago, and uh, they went on to tear their ACL when they were 16. They're now 30 years old, and as you can see, they both had cartilage resurfacing procedures at age 30. The problem is Carmen and Katie are not the exception, they're the rule. Once you tear your ACL, you have a relative risk of going on to an osteoarthritic knee within one to two decades between 50 and 100%. So very large downstream sequelae to this injury. This is Michael Owen tearing his ACL back in 2006. I'm gonna point four things out here. What he does is he, he's gonna step down with a relatively straight leg and then the leg is gonna collapse immediately as his trunk goes over laterally and most, if not all, of his weight is on a single leg or single foot. And that's really a, a very common mechanism. Here's another ACL injury. Now watch her from behind. See her pelvis drop down on the left side? She just popped her ACL. Again, a more subtle injury, but again, the connection between the movement of the, of the hip and the center of mass and the load on the knee joint. So what we do is we use multiple converging approaches, and I'm going to talk about several of them tonight. But we, we do in vivo data. So what we do is we bring these kids on, on school buses, entire teams. We do entire county school systems where we bring a team at a time on a school bus. And we have, depending on the study, between, say, 6 and 12 different stations. Motion stations. We measure anatomy. Sometimes we'll do BMI. Sometimes we're looking at uh, specific skeletal structures. So we'll take x-rays or MRIs. And then we have other stations where they're moving, landing, cutting, running, jumping on force plates. We have, we have balance measurements. We have anthropomorphic measurements. And then we put these all into our models, store that away on our computers, and let them go out and play sports. And we see who goes on to various types of injuries. This young man dislocated his knee. This, he was a long stabber for the Steelers. Now, what, what I want you to appreciate here is the connection between his center of mass and his knee joint. What happens is when his center of mass, so what he's done is he's dislocated his knee. So two things hold your joint together and stabilize it. The, the passive structures and the dynamic structures, the ligaments, the fascia around the joint, and the, the muscular restraints. What he's lost, because his knee was completely dislocated on the prior play, he's lost the, those passive restraints. So his dynamic restraints have to be very good, and his center mass has to be balanced over the plantar surface of his foot, or a torque occurs. Now, do we remember high school physics? Do we remember what a torque is? A torque is a force working at a distance from a joint center that that creates a rotational force around a joint. So what I want you to appreciate is as he's walking, he's hitting the ground, and he's actually hitting the ground with two or three times his body mass. And when the, when the trunk, the, the force is, is directed to his center of mass, and when his trunk moves this way, the force creates, is at a distance which tracks his center of mass, high force because he's not using his musculature well in high distance and therefore a high torque, which is 
pushing his knee into a, a varus position. Now, as I talked about, what we're using is what I call coupled biomechanical epidemiologic approaches to study these injuries. So what we do is we do these prospective longitudinal cohort studies. This is uh, one school system on the north side, Mason School System, north of uh, Cincinnati. And what we're doing is we're trying to get at predictors of first risk in these kids. Now, if you think about it, the prevalence in a high school athlete is somewhere, depending on what data you read, it's somewhere between one in 20 and one in 100 young female high school athletes is gonna rupture her ACL per year. So let's say on average one in 50. Well, if we need at least 20 events, that means we have to test at least 1,000 athletes. If we want more events like that, if we need, say, uh, 100 events, then we're gonna be testing 5,000 athletes. So the, the data is, it, it, this, is, this approach is very expensive, it's very labor intensive, it takes a lot of people, good crew of people, and we've been lucky enough to be funded for over 10 years now uh, by the NIH and, and NFL charities and, and other organizations to study this problem. This is a, a study we did at Yale where we looked at 300 collegiate athletes, again, a prospective longitudinal study, and what we did is, and this study was, was performed by a, a student that Yasek Cholowicki and I, I shared, uh, Billy Zaslak. What, what we did is we put them on what is basically amounts to a bar stool. So what they're doing is they're sitting on a bar stool and the axle of the bar stool is attached to a step motor. What the step motor did was turn them about 20 degrees, well actually exactly 20 degrees, and then with their eyes closed, with their arms crossed, they had to move themselves back to their original position and then press a button and say, I'm back where I originally started. It's a, it's a measure of trunk proprioception. So what Yasek showed in the Journal of Biomechanics paper was that if you didn't do this very well, if you didn't reproduce your position well, you had an increased risk of future low back pain. And I called Yasek and I said, well Yasek, did you collect knee injury data? He said, I don't know. I don't know whether we did that or not. Why did he ask? And I said, well we've got this theory that trunk control and trunk proprioception actually affects knee injury. And we found out that uh, he did actually have the data and we ran it and this is what it looked like. If you look at females that did not reproduce their positioning very well, their position of their trunk, they had significantly higher risk of knee, of ligament, and ACL injury, whereas males had no such relationship. We found this very interesting. Now what we did is another series of studies where we did what was called a sudden release experiment, and we reproduced all this equipment at, at the Ohio State University, as Aaron said. And so what they are in this situation is this is less about proprioception, it's about trunk control. So what they've got is they, they're in sort of a semi-kneeling position and they've got their pelvis fixed by a couple buttresses. They've got a weight vest on, and there's attached to the weight vest, there's there's a cable that runs to a pulley that runs down to an electromagnet on the floor, and they do an isometric contraction against that electromagnet. And then at an unknown time, an unanticipated time, the magnet releases, and they do this with their trunk, and we measured that. And we looked at trunk control and its association. Again, we found very highly significant when there was more displacement of the trunk, there was more risk of knee, ligament, and ACL injury. And if you broke it down by sex, there was a significant relationship in the women and there was not a significant relationship in the men. So what about biodynamics and biomechanics and how do we do this? I wanted to give a little bit of a background here on how we go after this. So biomechanics is science concerned with internal and external forces acting on the human body and the effects produced by these. And, and the, this model of ACL, and, and especially ACL in girls and women, is a great model system to, to apply biomechanics to, and to the point where you can actually change outcomes. And that's where we're gonna get. But, but first of all, if you look at how we measure kinematics, we use these very high-speed cameras, 200, and we, we can go up to 1,000 hertz or 1,000, 
flashes per second. That flashes off of body markers, which I'll show you. And, uh, and basically what we can do from there is collect data of where the joint centers are. So we can get joint angles, joint velocity, body posture, basically kinematics or motion. And if we have them running, landing, cutting, and jumping like we do with these, these teams that we bring in on buses, and we can measure the joint reaction forces, we have the two ingredients we need. Where the joint is in three-dimensional space, where the ground reaction force is related to that joint, and if you multiply the one versus the other, you can then calculate the torques about the joint and refer, infer net muscle activity. We can also use relatively qualitative measures. We do have runner's clinics where runners come in with anterior knee pain, and we can look at things like slight pelvic drop or slight inward movement, as you can see how her knee's crossing the midline and she's having anterior knee pain because what's going on is her patella is riding laterally, her femur's dipping in, and the two are coming, the, the lateral facet of the patella's, the underside of the patella's coming in contact with her femoral condyle, and she ends up with anterior knee pain. We have other relatively simple tools to do this. We published uh, several years ago now this tuck jump system where we can actually visually, a clinician can grade somebody's movement patterns and some of the biomechanical and neuromuscular deficits that they demonstrate. We can also get into a relatively simple pattern. Any of you clinicians can utilize something like a 2D measure. This is using ImageJ, which you can download. Uh, it actually came out of the NIH, it's freeware. And uh, you can do this to look at her relative sagittal plane, flexion extension angles, and you can look at frontal plane. You can synchronize the two views if you use a system like Dart Fisher, even with Image J, so that you can get an idea of, do you think this young lady is potentially at relative risk? Yeah. She is, and, and the thing about her is she, she's very active and she's a good athlete. And I should say that too, there's not a good strong correlation between these biomechanical neuromuscular deficits and imbalances that athletes demonstrate in their athletic ability. Some very good athletes demonstrate a significant number of these deficits. This is what the lab at Children's Hospital looks like. And what basically what we do at this lab is the same sort of thing they do with this commercial or the Matrix or Shrek. What we do is we have people with body markers and we build a body model and then what they do in the commercials is just simply put what's called a skin over top of that moving body model. But what we have in addition to this is we have force plates in the floor so that we not only have the motion or kinematics, we can calculate the kinetics on that and loads on that joint. So what we do is we use these marker sets. And again, this one is our standard 47 marker system. From there, we can get what the rigid body segments look like and where the joint centers are based on marker placement. This is just standing in a, a neutral position where we can measure the, the body mass and we can build a skeleton. We can calculate where the center of mass is. And then, then what we do is we use a global coordinate system based off x, y, z axes in all three planes and we can, we can uh, develop a local coordinate system to look at what the body segments look like, and we transform the one into the other, and then that's, that's how we get our kinematics or our motion, and then to get the kinetics or forces, we simply use Newton's law, force is equal to mass times linear acceleration, but because the joints are moving in angular fashion, what we do is translate that into Euler's law, which is the the moment or the torque acting on the joint is equal to the mass moment and inertia of the two segments times the angular acceleration of the joint. And again, using really relatively simple mathematics, we can calculate the torques on the body. And if you believe that, uh, I've got other stories to tell you. When I first started out in this field over 20 years ago, running a joint coordinate system, uh, we, I worked with kids with cerebral palsy uh, just having a couple runs across the force plate, we would put that on a supercomputer, a computer half the size of the front of this room here, and it would run for two days just to calculate those joint torques. Now we can do that instantaneously, and for a biomechanical geek like me, that's really, really cool. And what that means, though, is you can actually give biofeedback to people about what not only what their joint kinetics look like, 
uh, your, their joint kinematics, but the actual loads that, that their body's experiencing while they're training. So again, you can use relatively simple 2D tools, or you can use the 3D tools. It, it, that arrow is proportional to the ground reaction forces. And as I said, if we go back to a little bit of high school physics, remember Newton's third law? What was that? It was the law of equal and opposite re re reaction. So if I hit something, that something hits me back, including it doesn't have to be a moving force, it can be the ground. So when I hit the ground, the ground hits me back. But remember, force is equal to mass times acceleration. That first law, well, my body, my body segments have accelerations. So you're, they're, you're multiplying your mass times that. So simply, while I'm walking across, so think about that. I'm walking across this floor. I weigh about 220, maybe a little higher than that. But walking across the floor, I'm hitting the ground and the ground is hitting me back with two to three times my body weight, and those forces directed at my center of mass are, are actually coming up through my leg and through my knee joint. So if, if I'm at two or three times body mass hitting me, so that's somewhere between 440 and 660 pounds. This is your ACL. Your ACL is the size of your pinky. It's very proportional. The PCL is the size of your thumb, and they cross one another in your knee joint. That's why they're called cruciate. They cross one another, and as the knee flexes and extends, where they cross one another is basically the center of the hinge of the knee joint in the sagittal plane. So this little guy is very strong, and he has a what's called a high modulus of elasticity. So it takes about for the average person about uh, 1,800 Newtons or so to tear that, that uh, ligament. Did, does anybody know how much 1,800 Newtons is in pounds? It's a relatively simple conversion. It's 9.8 acceleration divided by 2.2, which is conversion to kilos. So that's 4.4545 repeating. So basically, if you divide by that, it's about 320-some pounds. Again, the in Cincinnati, we measured it was 1,800 newts at Terran ACL in New York City. Pete Dorzilli did it at HSS at Hospital for Special Surgery, and he said it was about 200 or 2,200 newtons. Of course, even cadavers in New York are tougher than everywhere else, right? <laughs> but wherever that is, it's say around 300 to 350 pounds. As I said, just walking across this floor, I have enough force jutting up through my leg and my knee joint to tear my ACL. But it doesn't tear because my muscles actually control that joint and absorb and dissipate those forces. So think about that when I'm landing, running, cutting, jumping. I'm going to show you videos of gymnasts landing where they're hitting the ground and the ground's hitting them back with upwards of 15 to 20 times their body weight. So muscular control, both, both controllers, both the passive, the ligamentous system, and the dynamic, the muscular system, are very important in stabilizing and controlling knee joint conformation and stability. Again, and we can do lots with this system. And we, we study runners. You can run across. And this is showing the capture volume based on a 10 camera system here. And we can do uh, just simple gait. This is a subject post-stroke. Uh, movement patterns, even gait, are slightly different with stroke. And what we can do is using that ground reaction force. And this is kind of interesting because you notice when he first lands, the ground reaction force, watch the, the motion of this. So a, a normal individual starts with the ground reaction force in front of the knee, then goes behind. So he's slightly different than normal. He's slower for one and lands with a more flexed knee because he's had a stroke. But what happens is that ground reaction force when it's behind the knee is basically crunching the knee down. It's collapsing the knee because it's behind the knee joint. Where and what happens is to what you what you generate is an internal torque to balance that. And that's primarily at this point at the quadricep muscle. When the ground reaction force goes in front of the knee joint, what it does is slam the knee joint back. It's called an external extension moment. And the knee flexors balance that. So again, you can calculate and infer net joint moments or torques. And you can, again, you, we can track the kinematics, and we can tell off these kinematics that these are relatively abnormal. 
again, we can, the problem is in the laboratory, we haven't been able to measure someone tearing their ACL, thank goodness, or I probably wouldn't be able to get too many studies through the IRB anymore. Uh, but, but what we have to do is use multiple systems to figure out the mechanisms. And here's another system that we use. We, we use a foot pressure system. This is a study we did out at a, in a high school football team where we looked at relative foot pressure so that the graphs show the relative pressures in the various regions of the foot. And what we can do is mount this on a backpack. And I should say, two of my coworkers, Greg's been doing all, as you can see, I'm not out here on the field, these guys are. I'm the one that's running around the world talking to you guys and having a good time. These guys actually do all the work. So this is Greg Meyer, he's a, a, a guy who basically ran my lab for over 15 years, he's got his own lab now. Uh, this is Kevin Ford, same thing, he's our techno guy, been working with me about 13 years and he just, he just took a job as a professor uh, out at another university. And this is a study we did, again, out on a football field. It, this school had just gotten one of those new uh, turf fields, one of the, called field turf, and they had it right next to, to their, football, their grass football field. And one of the questions we had is, what are the loading patterns like on this? And how do they differ grass versus, versus field turf if you're wearing a cleat versus a turf shoe? And basically what, what we showed was that the turf condition had significantly higher pressures within the central forefoot and the lesser toes, whereas if, with the um, grass condition, what you do is you end up more with the lateral fit, uh, foot point, uh, a midfoot, uh, loading and what this means is it has significant say for how you would develop orthotics on grass versus turf are actually quite different and what we showed is those individuals like this young guy we, we did have in this set a prospective studies of ACL injuries and somebody who rapidly loads the lateral side of their foot and then goes into the medial so sort of a rocker effect has a significantly increased risk of tearing their ACL. And what this gives us is information about orthotic development, about foot classifications, and we've done several studies on hyperpronated versus higher arch feet and what the relative risk profiles are. At SUNY Downstate, we even did a study with chimps looking at their loading. I finally felt sort of uh, akin to the lab study people at that point. But we, we, we found some very interesting patterns there. And, and basically what we do is we see, we can go, we take portable force platforms out and we can do things like single leg force measurements using this AccuPower force platform. This is really important. I'm gonna show you data on this on someone who after they've torn their ACL. Because what they do is even two years out post injury, they tend to not be able to generate as much power on that reconstructed leg, and we'll talk about why we think that is. And again, we can bring the kids into the lab. We can take the force plates out to them. These are embedded force plates in our lab. We can again use inverse dynamics. That's how we calculate the relative torques and forces on their joints. We can do things like track their movement. This is the movement, as you can see, this undulating movement of the center mass. A lot of people think that's a linear movement. It, it is overall linear, but it is more cyclic or sign-like. And we can, again, use that because somebody who has, say, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis has a different movement of their center mass. You can use that to, to look at an individual's disability, so hopefully that you can develop interventions that are, that are going to, to uh, prevent that kind of loading. So now let's get into ACL injuries in women. So interestingly about these ACL injuries, more than 70% occur by non-contact. In other words, someone's not taking out their knees. So you know even in the NFL, that's as high a contact sport as you can possibly get, over 70% of the ACL injuries in the NFL occur by non-contact. Somebody's just cutting, landing, now the good thing about that is, we probably can't prevent, if you've got a 350 pound lineman come roll your knee, we probably can't prevent that, what's probably gonna turn out to be a dislocation rather than just an ACL injury, 
But if it's just a non-contact injury that's based on your own movement patterns, that gives us the potential to prevent it. The problem is pretty large. There are at least 120,000 a year of these. It's probably closer to double that, 250,000 in the US. And as Aaron stated, females are somewhere between two and 10 times higher risk than males if we normalize for their amount of exposure on the field or on the court. And there's been lots of suggested factors. It's uh, related to anatomy or related to hormones. Where we really focused our work is neuromuscular control and biomechanics because these seem to be some of the biggest players and also they're the only ones that are really modifiable where we can really make a difference with this approach. So basically I went back 15 years ago and I came to the NFL charities and I said you guys need to fund this problem because it's a big problem. And they said, well, it's, it's in women. How does that relate to football? I said, well, what we have is a model of high-risk athletes just like NFL football players. If you look at it that way, per exposure, a female athlete playing basketball is on the level of an NFL athlete who's playing in a, in a very high-contact, high-load sport. In the NCAA, there are about 150,000 participants and one in 10 every year is going to suffer a serious knee injury that puts her out of her sport. At the high school level, this is, is different. It, it, the risk is not one in 10. It's somewhere, as I said earlier, between about one in 20 and one in 100. The big difference is the numbers are, as you could guess, are huge in high school. So back before Title IX, does everyone know what Title IX was? Said we had to give equal opportunity and most importantly, equal money to women's and sports relative to men's sports at the collegiate level. Well, what that did, of course, is funnel in all these women into high school sports and junior high school sports seeking these scholarships that became available. And so what we went to from prior to 1972 there were about 270,000 girls playing high school sports. There are now, it's been geometric growth, the amount doubles every 10 years, now well over 3 million. It's reaching where the boys are and actually in the next decade could actually surpass it. The problem is we didn't know in the sports medicine clinic, even if there was five times higher risk back in 1970, there were 10 times fewer players. So there'd be half as many ACL injuries showing up into a sports medicine clinic. But once we brought up that number to more equal, then we started seeing a lot more young women in the clinic. Again, that four to six fold higher risk was probably already there, but it didn't show through until the numbers came up. And so again, the federal government has concerns because this was a federal edict that led to a downstream effect that they didn't expect. And we, we have garnered a fair amount, over $10 million at this point in, in National Institutes of Health funding to study this problem. And again, here's the problem. This is a devastating injury for these young women. And I'm gonna talk about how devastating a second ACL is. So, and I'm gonna talk about how frequent it is. So once you tear one ACL, your risk of tearing another goes up enormously. And for you people that work through these athletes and are sending these people back onto the field, that has huge consequences to them, to you, because as devastating as that first ACL injury is, the second one is extremely devastating. Carmen and Katie both have two ACL injuries. How many double ACL injuries do we have in the audience? <laughs> Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a devastating thing to happen. And again, there are extrinsic factors like the shoe and the surface. So we were part of a study in the NFL where we showed it looks like, so it seems like we're always getting progress, right? So we've developed these new sports turfs. And in Ohio, we have a, a, one of the major sport turf manufacturers. It's called Mott's. It's between Cincinnati and Columbus where I drive back and forth every week. Mott, uh, Mod Group has several uh, fields and, and we started studying this with the Hospital for Special Surgery and basically what we saw was 
there's, with the new turfs relative to grass, it looks like, and again, this is relatively preliminary data that was presented at the combine, the, the medical directors uh, at the combine uh, a couple years ago, where it looks like ACL risk and high ankle sprain risk is actually higher on these new turfs. And we kind of knew that from the pre foot pressure data as well. So again, there's lots of potential inputs, and this is a multifactorial problem. For instance, a lot of people say it's, it's about anatomy. So uh, especially surgeons are obviously very geared toward anatomy. So one idea is that it's the notch, uh, it, the femoral notch. So at the end of your femur, you have a, a notch in which the ACL and PCL, the, these little guys sit. That, there has to be space for them, right? Well, that resides in this notch, and the idea is that in in women, the notch is more A-shaped and kind of more narrow, whereas in men, it's more rounded and larger. Now, Down Shelbourne from Indianapolis did several studies on this, and he concluded that that's not different. The shape and size are not different relative to the body size in men and women, but he did conclude that if you had a narrow or more A-shaped notch, whether you're a man or a woman, you had a higher risk of tearing your ACL. There's also this idea of the Q angle or the quadriceps angle. Everyone knows what a Q angle is. ASIS, anterior superior iliac spine, center of the kneecap to where the, the patellar tendon inserts on the tibial tubercle. That's your Q angle. The idea is women have a slightly larger Q angle or quadriceps. But the reason it's called Q or quadriceps is that's that's the angle through which the extensor mechanism of the leg works, the, the quadriceps works. And the idea is if that angle's greater, it creates greater, especially varus valgus torques on the knee joint. And that may be the case, but I can tell you, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this on the news where a surgeon will be interviewed and he'll say, oh, it's because girls and women have wider hips, so they have a greater Q angle, that's why they tear their ACL. But if you look at the data, there's been one study that showed an association between the Q angle and, and future risk of an ACL, there's been at least 10 that show there's no such association. So it's important that we really look at the data. Uh, the, the other idea is this hormonal idea, that because women have a hormonal cycle, that's what puts them at greater risk. And we've done several studies in this area. One of the first studies after we did the EPI study that I undertook was funded by the Orthopedic Research an education foundation looking at hormonal inputs. There probably are some hormonal inputs, but when we looked at the data, our own data, and then we did all the meta-analyses of the entire literature base a couple years ago, what it shows is this. Right at the peak, so a woman's cycle, menstrual cycle, is on average about 28 days. About 12 days in, or about halfway, day 12 to 14, estrogen peaks, and then progesterone peaks with it, right about day 12 to 14. Now, what the data says is if you take an arthrometer, everyone knows what a KT1000 or 2000 is, arthrometer, you lay them down on an exam table and you pull their tibia forward relative to their femur, their tibia comes forward a little bit, but not much, about half a millimeter. About, that's about a hair's width. Now, to a guy like me, who's a little challenged, that's significant. But that's probably not clinically significant for injury risk. And then if you look when the injuries clump, when they occur in the cycle, they occur at exactly the opposite end of the cycle, near day zero, right when menses starts. And so, again, you'll hear a lot of people say this, oh, it's, it's about women's hormones. These all probably play into the overall model, and we collect all this data and we feed it into our models. What we find is a standing quadriceps angle or a, a notch width or, or a, when they are in the cycle is not, they are not great predictors for risk. They are probably part of the story, but relatively small. And that's good news because we can't change those things anyway. Neuromuscular control and biomechanical loading of the joint really plays major roles in our prediction models. 
And the good thing is we can change them. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. This is Shea Rao from UConn. You know which ACL this was? It was her fifth ACL tear. So you can imagine how devastating that is. That probably one of the best players in the NCAA, and she didn't go on uh, to much of a, a pro career, and she's got lots of downstream consequences of those five ACL surgeries and rehabilitations, I, I can pretty much guarantee you. So again, where we focus a lot is on altering neuromuscular control, enhancing balance, enhancing proprioception, enhancing agility. I will give you the punchline of my talk right now. You can walk out after this. Well, if, you, if you do, you might get in some trouble or something thrown at you. But basically, if you can teach an athlete to control their center of mass over the plantar surface of their foot with the knee in a stable configuration, you can prevent ACL injuries. Now, when we first published this data back in 1999, a lot of people criticized that. We had a relatively small cohort. It was about 1,500 kids, and we showed a reduction of 62% in relative risk of ACL injury. People said that's not enough numbers. You didn't have enough ACL injuries. There, a group, a coalition of groups around the world did a study in 30,000 female soccer players. They looked at relative risk profile, and they, they enhanced based on our earlier work, did an intervention. They reduced it in 30,000 in a randomized controlled trial by 64%. And this is about to come out in the British Medical Journal. So there's really good, really solid data that we can reduce relative risk by about 50, 60%. So if we're going to get at reducing risk, the first thing we have to do is get at the mechanism. We have to figure out how the injuries occur in the first place. So basically, this is what it looks like. And I challenge any of you here to show me a video of a woman or girl tearing her ACL that these four components aren't there. I bet you can't find it. There's a prize for you if you can email me that video. Knee abduction. What happens is, so remember from PT class, AB, what does abduction mean? It means away from the midline of the body. So why am I calling that abduction? Well, in biomechanics speak, we start from the ground up. And what's abducting is the distal tibia is abducting away from the midline of her body. Her knee is collapsing in to the midline. It happens, it starts with her leg in relatively low flexion position, knees relatively straight. Most, if not all, the weight is on a single leg or single foot. And if I were to drop a vertical, remember, this is hitting the ground. The ground is hitting this back, and it's directed here. Now, if I were to drop a vertical from her center of mass down to the floor, what it would show is that the foot is displaced away from her center of mass. Her body's out of control. And I'll talk more about why that is. And again, why we use these prospective longitudinal approaches to get at these problems. This is one of these prospective longitudinal studies that we published seven years ago now. And what we did is we looked at a whole cohort of individuals. We pre-screened them. We went out and let them play. And here's what we saw. Those that didn't go on to injury basically landed in a neutral knee position with a good amount of knee flexion. Those that went on to ACL injury, and this is ensemble average, this is average data of all those that went on to an ACL injury, they land in five degrees of abduction. And then what happens, what they're doing is a drop vertical jump <laughs> off of a box and going into a max vertical. So what happens is you land as your knees tend to collapse in. So their max collapse was nine degrees. As you can see, eight degrees more on average than those that don't go on to an injury, and they're about 10 degrees less flexed. Now this abduction motion or inward collapse or valgus collapse or what we call dynamic valgus was actually a really good predictor of who was going to go on to a future injury. So this is the spread. This is the angle right at initial contact of when they hit the ground and go into that max vertical. This is the scatter of that angle, and these X's are the ACLs. Do you think this is predictive? It's highly predictive. It can predict with about 80% sensitivity 
In other words, who's at risk? In 80% specificity, it doesn't pick out those people that are not at risk, and it's a really good screening tool. And this is good news because this is relatively easy to capture. This is, this is done with a million dollar motion lab, but you don't have to have that. You can, you can garner an angle with 2D video, and we're doing those studies now. The other interesting thing about this data scatter, what it shows is about half, somewhere between a quarter and a half of these kids are probably at risk. And this was with 200 kids. We've redone this study with over 2,000, and it looks that way still. It's somewhere between a quarter and a half of these young female athletes are at relatively high risk. Anyone want to see an ACL? Look at her. Boom. See those components that I talk about? See what, what, what starts this? It's the lateral movement of her body. So she's hitting her ground. The ground's hitting her back with here probably... Oh, it's got to be 10 plus times body weight. She moves the center of mass over, the ground reaction force tracks it, and it goes lateral to the knee joint and collapses her knee in. So this is women t women's team handball. Does anybody know women's team handball? So i got to tell you the Norwegian story. So I have seen about every single video there is of someone tearing their ACL. That's, when, that's why when you guys watch this, you kind of wince, and I, there's no response from me whatsoever. So what we did is Norwegians love to win gold medals. They're some of the most competitive people in the world. If you look per capita, they are by far the highest gold medal winners in the Olympics in the world. There's only about three million people in Norway and they win all these Olympic gold medals. But what do they win it in? They win it in all these kind of goofy sports where you ski and shoot and do all that kind of. I don't know. You guys might do that up in Maine. We don't, we don't do that stuff in Ohio. Anyway, so that, but what about the Summer Olympics? They don't win anything in the Summer Olympics, right? But they do in one sport. You know what that sport is? Women's team handball. So you see all these videos of women's team handball? Do you see how all those four components, she lands with her knee relatively straight, it collapses in, her trunk is coming this way, and most of her weight's on a single foot. Are you buying that? You see this one? Same thing. See that one? Watch her. As she comes forward, knee's relatively straight, trunk's going to come sideways, and the knee's going to collapse into the midline with most of her, her weight on one foot. Very, very common. So the Norwegian story. So the Norwegians won like 88 Olympics and 92 Olympic gold in women's team handball, and then they lost their four top players to ACLs. And they came in like they got bronze or something that the king of Norway wasn't too happy with. So he gave the, the Oslo Sports Trauma Research Center about 10 million kroner. That's, uh, at that time, was about $20 million to figure out this problem. That's why I've spent a lot of the last 20 years over in Norway looking at these videos in a Norwegian dungeon. And ba basically what I've got is this sort of clockwork orange effect, you know, hold my eyelids open and watch this stuff till I actually have no, you, you, I just, I can't empathize at all. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not a clinician, right? They don't, they, don't even, they don't even let me touch the subjects in the lab anymore. So I think we're okay there. But here's why, here's why, the Norwegian problem occurred. Because if you watch what these ladies are doing, so the goal is you juke your opponent, you stop and decelerate really rapidly, really rapidly, and you torque your body around and try to fake them out and throw the ball. Does this position look familiar to you? This is how you're trying to score a goal in women's team handball. So in women's basketball in the US, the relative prevalence is about 1 in 20. So about one player per team per year is going to pop her ACL. You know what it's like in elite women's team handball? It's like one in four or one in five. It's incredible. I have pictures of the entire uh, Norwegian team, the, the Olympic handball team. There's 25 individuals, and I think there's like 22 knees out of those 25 individuals that, that have reconstructed ACLs. What they're doing is they're re recapitulating the mechanism that we just talked about. So here's the bad news. 
With each one of these parts of the mechanism, knee abduction, low flexion, single leg, foot away from the center mass, we have an associated neuromuscular imbalance that relates to that part of the mechanism. The first, knee abduction, the, the knee collapsing in, where we're going to say relates to a neuromuscular imbalance we're going to call ligament dominance. And I'm going to tell you in a minute what I think that means. Low flexion part of the mechanism, quadriceps dominance. Women are very quad dominant. To stabilize, decelerate, they use their quad a lot more than men do relatively. Single leg part of the mechanism, I'm going to call leg dominance. And foot away from the center mass, I'm going to call, let's call it trunk dominance. Now here's the good news in all this. How do we make women or other high-risk athletes at lower risk of tearing their ACL? This knee abduction, we teach them. We show them videos of themselves. We put them in front of the mirror, and we show them bad biomechanics, and then we show them good biomechanics. We tell them, when you're cutting on a soccer field, don't let your knee drop into the midline. It's going to increase your risk of rupturing your ACL. The low flexion part, what we're going to do is power up the relative ham quad ratio, but everything in the posterior kinetic chain. We're really going to hit the glute and glute activation. Women underactivate their glutes relative to men. I'll show you some of that data too. The glute is the biggest muscle in the human body. It's the most powerful muscle in the human body, and it is the only triaxial, triplanar controller of the position of the femur. So as you might guess, this is extremely important. Now, a lot of people will really focus on glute med. The problem with glute med, it does abduct and it keeps your femur from dropping in, but it's not very big and not that powerful, and it doesn't have triaxial control like glute max does. Now, the whole glute complex and the whole hip complex and the whole core complex are important, and we're going to hit all of them, uh, but, but the glute max is especially important, along with the hammies. Single leg part of the mechanism, we're going to do a lot of single leg balance, hopping, symmetry work. And the foot away from the center of mass, we're going to do a lot of core stability training. But it's not really going to be your infomercial type core stability. It's going to be a lot of closed kinetic chain, foot on the ground, very dynamic core control. Hopping the hold positions and, and good functional stable knee positions. So. Watch her land, and then watch him land. He uses his knees like hinges on stiff springs, with the muscular springs absorbing and dissipating the force. Look at the difference. It's almost like a ball and socket joint on loose springs. So this is a hinge on stiff springs absorbing force. This ball and socket joint, here's the problem. The big primary movers, glute max, quad, ham, calf complex, they're designed to absorb and dissipate force and flexion extension in the sagittal plane. You go to a lot of frontal plane movement, they don't absorb and dissipate force very well. A lot of that force goes to the bone and to the ligament, to the joint itself. And that's a real problem to have that kind of ligament. That's what I mean by ligament dominance, because instead of the being muscle dominant and having the muscles absorb and dissipate the force, the joint and the ligament absorbs and sometimes dissipates to the point of rupture. This is what it looks like biomechanically, and I'm going to make four points here. So what we do is we ask her to drop off that box, just like I showed you, and go into a max vertical jump. She's rebounding a basketball. First thing she does is she points with her dominant right foot which leads to an extended dominant right limb, which leads to a very high ground reaction force, asymmetric to the other side, which pushes, because it's lateral to the knee joint, it pushes the joint in. High force, high distance to the joint center, high torque, high load on the joint. This is, what, again, here's another picture of it. That ground reaction force is proportional to body weight. That each, on each side, that's almost three times body weight. Do you see where it's reacting? It's reacting to her center mass. If she lets her knees drop in, that's going to create a high dynamic valgus torque on her knee joint. This is a series of studies we did at Quinnipiac, Quinnipiac and Yale looking at relative activation of the musculature. And basically what we found was women compared to men, if everything is normalized, activate their quad a lot more 
and their glute max and glute medius complex a lot less than, than women and men, than, uh, men do. So critical analysis and feedback are, are very important. So dynamic valgus is extremely important. So, so where we've gone with these studies now, we know we can measure this, so we've gone into screening. See this going red? So this is a technique we developed with our models where as soon as that goes red, she's crossed the high-risk threshold. If she goes above, she's going over 25 newton meters of torque on her knee joint. And see how high those ground reaction forces are? The reason they're so high is she's not using her sagittal plane musculature, the big primary movers, to absorb that force. And it's not being absorbed, and it's very high, and it, it's being absorbed at the, at the knee joint and the hip joints. So where we're going with this is prediction of high-risk individuals. We're getting at who's at relatively high risk, and I'm going to show you some examples of how we do this. So we just use this simple drop vertical jump test, drop off a box and go into a max vertical, and we use relatively simple just 2D cameras, same kind of camcorder you could buy at Walmart any day. And what we can do is we can measure tibia length. So remember, the... The femur and the tibia are the longest levers in the human body. The knee joint is the largest joint in the human body. It experiences some of the largest torques and loads. And so, so the length of that lever relates to how high those torques are. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure tibial length. And really it is, it's simple physics as well. The bigger you are, the more increase your risk is. The more body mass you have, the, the longer your bones, in other words, the taller you are, the higher your BMI is, the higher relative risk you have. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But this is a young basketball player. She's just, just reached maturity at, in adolescence, about 15 years old. And she has a relatively long tibia of 45 centimeters. So in this nomogram, she gets relatively high points. She gets 79 points for a tibia length of, of, uh, of that amount. She has about three centimeters of valgus motion at the, on one knee, so she gets 13 and a half points. She has relatively short arc range of motion. We want a lot of range of motion in the knee, and what she gets is nine and a half points. Remember, if you go into a flex position and you go through a high arc range of motion, what you're doing is the center of mass is moving significantly in the Z, in the Z axis, and that is dissipating force. That actually is a force dissipator. So the less arc range of motion you have, the higher force and the higher load. So she gets nine and a half points. She has 71 kilos of mass. She gets 20 points. She has a relatively high quad to hamstring ratio. She gets eight and a half points for a total of 135 points. Using relatively simple, just one erg uh, ergometer or dynamometer, which we don't really need. We can factor into the equation. But just using simple measures that we can do with any camcorder and a scale, we come up with a 97% risk that she's in a high load torque on her knee joint. What we did, this was actually Greg Meyer's thesis work, side by side we did the million dollar motion lab 3D motion test and, and, and saw that it's 50 newton meters. It's double the high risk threshold. So what we're doing is we're using that not only to look at things like ACL but also patellofemoral risk. As I said earlier, if you have a lot of valgus motion while you're landing, like during running, what happens is your, your patella rides laterally and it creates uh, pressure in that knee joint. And what we're showing is using relatively simple tools that we can look at some of the, some of the same predictors, some different predictors between the ACL and patellofemoral pain and come up with nomograms that can predict multiple kinds of knee and hip problems. So let's get at adolescence and pubertal growth. This is me with my five older sisters. I actually have more sisters than this. This little guy here is me. I would be about uh, four months old here. This is my sister Dawn. Uh, she's 11 years older than me. So she just went from almost no risk of an ACL injury to five times higher than her male counterparts. 
It's my sister Patty, best athlete in our neighborhood, pre-Title IX though, so she went to OU, uh, two vars played two varsity sports, but mom and dad paid her way. It's my sister Jenny. She tore her ACL playing basketball. She's now 54 years old, and she has uh, she had a hamstrings graft that stretched out on her. She has a swollen, painful osteoarthritic knee that she calls me every three or four months and says, Tim, what else do I need to do to put off my total knee joint? And again, the problem is she is not the exception. She is the rule. So let's talk about adolescence a little bit. Prior to adolescence, as we said, Girls don't have a high risk of ACL, and actually their relative risk is about the same as boys the same age. Now, a lot of problems with studies of this, this period look at chronological age. You cannot compare neuromuscularly or biomechanically or really any other way a 10-year-old or 11-year-old boy to a 10 or 11-year-old girl. They're totally different animals. Well, they're both very scary animals at that point, but they're totally different animals. Girls hit their growth spurt about a year and a half earlier than boys do. Here's a case study. She came in and we tested her in our lab and we got all kind of neuromuscular and biomechanical data on her. Let's say one, two, three, four, five, six. This is at least six stations worth of data. She's 11, she's 12, she's 13. Remember the longest levers in the body, see how much longer they're getting? Look at more mass in the trunk, harder to control. Center of mass, which is all about well, how well you balance, is coming up off the ground. And about two weeks after this third measurement at age 13, boom, pop, she, she ruptured her ACL. So what did she look like over that time span from the time she was 11, 12, 13 years old neuromuscularly? Well, her quad strength is actually going up per her body size. Now this is all normalized. Everything I'm showing you is normalized to their weight, to their body mass, to their height. And so it's a fair comparison looking at someone who's younger versus when they're older. Relatively, her quad strength is going up. Her hamstring strength is going down. Her ham quad ratio is going way down. In other words, ham, quad is dominating. Her abduction, her hip abduction peak torque is going down. Now what's she looking like biomechanically? Well, here's her vertical jump. So a vertical jump is a great, very reliable, valid, reproducible measure of whole body power. It's, it, I, I can tell you there's almost no better measure you can take and that's as anybody can measure that if you do it right. It stays the same. We're going to talk more about this in a minute, but her vertical jump stays the same. Now, what is happening to her torque, that, a, that dynamic valgus torque per time? So what this is is knee torque or knee load impulse. So that's the amount of torque applied per second. Now, that's, impulse is actually what tears ligaments because what, what, when you get that torque applied very high and it happens very rapidly, that's what ruptures an ACL, and that goes up, up, and up until pop, she ruptures her ACL. So here's our current thinking on this. This is kind of a fancy thing that I put together for a grant application, but I think I can come up with a simpler way of saying this. Here's a, a car analogy. So you have boys and girls start out with a Chevy, let's say, uh, what are one of those little new Chevys, a Volt or something like that? So they both start out with a little Volt car with a little Volt engine. But the, but the size of the machine is okay matched with the size of the engine. Then what happens is they get a growth spurt. Both boys and girls get a growth spurt. Let's say they go from a Chevy to a Cadillac. They've got a bigger machine overall. What happens with boys is very soon after that growth spurt, they get what's called a neuromuscular spurt. They get significantly more powerful, mainly from testosterone, enhancing their muscle size, muscle power. So even though they're getting a Cadillac, they're actually getting a Cadillac or actually a Porsche size engine. They're getting disproportionately more powerful, whereas 
girls are getting the bigger machine, but about the same size engine. And that's a big size to power mismatch. And I think that's where we see these differences in neuromuscular control. And that's what I'm saying here. If you get these longer levers, you end up with more mass, higher forces, more, more mass and force in the trunk. Without this neuromuscular spurt, and what you end up with is decreased hip and knee muscle strength and recruitment, decreased neuromuscular control, increased dynamic valgus, increased abduction load, and increased injury risk. So, so far we've been talking mainly about first injury risk. Now we're going to talk about the real killer, second injury risk. You, you know who you are. If you've had a first one, do you know how much higher your risk is of tearing a second one? I'm going to show you. So this is, uh, was uh, one of my students, Mark Paterno, was his thesis work that we did this over the past couple years. So here was the range. So early on, Laxdahl, this is a Swedish study. The Swedes do a lot of the work in outcomes research because it's a socialized medical system. Everybody is on a national register and they can track their outcomes well. So a lot of that comes out of Scandinavia. So what they said, what this data said was around 17, one, 1 in 17. So again, let's go back to first injury risk. What did I say it was? Young athletes, high school level, the, the, we're talking prevalence. This is not a rate, it's, a, it's how many per a segment of the population. It's about uh, between 1 in 20 and 1 in 100. After you've torn your ACL, Laxdahl said it was about 1 in 17. Don Shelbourne and our data match to this say it's about one in four. So you've gone from a risk of say one in 60 on average to about one in four. And again, whether you've had an ACL or not, if you're working, if you're an athletic trainer or physical therapist, working with these individuals, you have to think about this. They just went from an on the street risk of say one in 60 to one in four of tearing a second ACL. And the other problem, again, is this long-term risk of osteoarthritis. So we did a, a study. The important thing is the difference of this and earlier studies was we looked at young individuals. On average, our age was 16. So what happens if you're young and active and you go back to sport with a reconstructed ACL? Your risk is about 23% of tearing a second ACL. It's huge. Again, we showed that same five and a half fold greater risk in females. But here was another really interesting finding. Your chances of tearing your other leg are about six times higher than tearing your graft. Now that's pretty interesting, is it? What it also speaks to is it speaks to prevention because there shouldn't be anything wrong with this side. I can, I can talk for another two hours on why I think it is this side. It relates to several things. For one thing, what you do is you shift load, biomechanical load to that other side. But also, this little guy, the ACL, when you reconstruct him, what you do is basically take a hot dog of tissue, either from your hamstrings or from your patellar tendon or your quad tendon or a cadaver, and you replace really what's a really a pretty little thing. It's almost like a butterfly shape. It has a lot of three-dimensional angular shape to it. And it not only controls, we, we simplify it with an arthrometer and say we, all it does is resist anterior translation of the tibia relative to the femur. It does a lot more than that. It resists varus valgus. It in, resists internal external rotation of the tibia because of this unique geometry. But instead, we, we sort of insert this cylinder of tissue, which isn't going to control varus valgus very well, and it's not going to control rotation hardly at all. And this little guy, we've been talking about him as sort of this rubber band of elastomeric tissue. He's about 3 to 5 percent nervous tissue, mechanoreceptor. And after he's ruptured, that mechanoreceptor doesn't come back. We've been picking on the Norwegians a lot, so I'll tell another Norwegian story. In dogs, there's a little bit of evidence back from the early 80s 
that there might be a little bit of neural re-ingrowth after you reconstruct an ACL. But for whatever a, uh, an N of one study is worth, there was a guy in Norway, had his ACL reconstructed, tried to survive the depression of the ACL with the black, dark Norwegian winter and ended up doing himself in, right? They took his ACL out, his graft, and looked at it, and there was absolutely no re of that graft. Even if there were re innervation, mechanoreceptors and the neural system and the feedback loops, the afferent, efferent feedback loops they provide are very highly well tuned to orientation, tension on the graft, tension on the nerve. <coughs> and if, uh, And the problem is, if you lose that, you don't get it back. So that's a big part of this problem. You're not, you're not feeling, you're not sensing that ligament as well. So there's a couple of issues going on here. So what we wanted to get at was, <clears throat> what increases risk? There's my drink. I got drink. <clears throat> what we're getting at is, what increases this risk? So what we did is we looked at, at several, we looked at over 3,200 parameters and we developed a model system to predict at who's at relative risk. And we won the NCA award from the AOSSM in 2010 for this study. And what we did was just like I'd been showing you, we looked at that ground reaction force after landing onto the force plates during a drop vertical jump. And this was key. If you didn't generate a good external rotation moment at the other hip, you had, and remember what does that. It's here and here. It's glute max. If you don't generate that, you have an eight-fold higher risk of tearing your ACL another time. And if you have that valgus knee kinematic where you let your knee drop in, you have three and a half times greater risk. This is what the torque looks like about your hip joint. These are the people that went on to a second ACL injury versus those that are reconstructed and did not go on to an injury. What you see is, right here, this is zero. So this is external rotation moment at the hip. This is internal rotation moment. So these people were actually generating an internal rotation moment at the hip. They were taking their knee into that dynamic valgus position. And here's what they look like. The Red boxes are those that go on to a second ACL injury relative to the scatter of all. This is also highly predictive. And if you look at the relative rate, here's the contralateral side. Six times higher risk of tearing the other side versus the reconstructed graft. So here are all the variables together. If you don't generate a good external, now remember what you guys as rehab professionals can do. You can train them to increase external hip rotation. I'm going to talk about how you do it. But you can make a difference here. But if they're, at the time they're going back to sport, if they're not generating a good external hip rotation moment, they have eight and a half times greater risk of tearing their ACL, another ACL, usually on the other side. If they have 2D frontal plane knee motion, that valgus kinematic, they have three and a half fold greater risk. If they have side-to-side -side differences in relative ham quad activation, in other words, they're quad dominant and it's asymmetric side-to-side, -side, they have three and a half fold greater risk. And if they have decreased postural stability on the involved side, they have two and a half fold greater risk. And what we did is build a model, a statistical model, where we put just these four. So we had measured well over 3,200 variables. It came down to these four variables could account for 94% of the variance. In other words, it predicts that well. So again, postural stability tests. So this is a rock curve. This is a receiver operating curve. And what this says is we could predict with 92% sensitivity who was at greater risk of a second ACL tear and with 88% specificity those who weren't at risk. And again, here's our predictors not generating an external rotation moment at the hip at landing, 2D frontal plane knee motion, 
asymmetries in sagittal plane pneumos moments and deficits in postural stability. Again, if you're not generating that external rotator moment, so again, things like starting out with clamshells, you can start with that and then getting into very dynamic foot-based uh, measures, and I, I'll talk about what sort of exercises we do to promote these decreased Increased valgus kinematics, three and a half fold greater risk. Asymmetry in relative quad ham activation side to side, three and a half fold. Deficits in single leg balance. Again, we can all increase our, our single leg balance with training significantly. This is another set of motor control studies we did. She's had her ACL reconstructed. This is what the biofeedback screen looks like in front of her. It's going away from her and towards her, and we're saying keep your face the same distance away from that rectangle as it moves toward and from you. This is what the subject looks like. This is uh, what, what I was showing you was at 0.6 hertz. So this is the relatively fast speed. And then we have them at 0.2 hertz, which is a relatively slow speed. And this is what people look like. So a 0.2 hertz, and then you're going faster. And what we're doing in motor control measures here is we're looking at the synchronization between the ankle, the knee, and the hip joint, and how they sync with one another. For instance, the ankle is usually 180 degrees out of phase with the hip. They're going in opposite directions as they flex, as you do that swaying. And what happens is the variability between those two in normal individuals goes up. Makes sense, right? The faster you go, the more variability and phasing you're going to have. Here's what an ACL reconstructed individual looks like. They don't have that change in variability. What we think they're doing is because this is already difficult at a slow speed, they have more variability, and then when it goes faster, they can't control it, so they just sort of lock the joints down. And then here's what those that go on to a second ACL injury, their pattern is exactly opposite. So doing it at a slow speed is very difficult to sense and control those three joints together, and then when it goes fast, they completely lock the joint down. And again, this is potentially predictive. This is uh, a fancy statistical test called a cross-recurrence analysis, and basically what we show is that's very linear here. And then what happens after someone's reconstructed, that starts to break down that linear, linear phasing of the three joints. So that's obviously not normal. Again, this guy doesn't have those mechanoreceptors. Why would we expect it to be normal? And then those that go on to a second are going to go on to a second injury. Here's what their pattern looks like. That phasing is significantly broken down. Those people don't sense that joint well. So you all as rehab professionals, it's understood that you're going to have these people with this hot dog of tissue in their knee that's not the same. I don't care what any surgeon says. It's not the same as what God gave them. But you can do things like enhance extra articular, other sort of sensing mechanisms around the joint, and other methods of neuromuscular control, like activating the glutes, to compensate for that in a good way. The problem is many of these athletes compensate for those losses in proprioception and kinesthesia in a bad way. You all as rehab professionals have to make sure that they, that they compensate the right way. And the right way is decreasing that hip internal rotation moment, decreasing dynamic valgus, decreasing asymmetries, decreasing postural deficits. You all can do that in clinic or in a training room for that matter. So again, these outcomes after ACL reconstruction are questionable and challenging. There's varied return, varied return, abnormal neuromuscular strategies. We've shown that again and again. There's osteoarthritis downstream and second risk. So these are the kids that are actually going back to sport. Back when they did this data with 30 years old, it's not as big a deal because they're not going back at the same level on a soccer field or a basketball court. The kids who do have a one in four to one in five risk. So what we're doing is we're using very criterion-based rehabilitation to progress them, not by time, but by very objective measures. And then we're adding in, say, after they run out of their specific number of visits to the, to the PT clinic, we add in neuromuscular training that's going to attack those four deficits that we see that, that increase risk so that hopefully we can get better outcomes. Again, this hip. 2D knee motion, asymmetry in sagittal plane moments, and decreased knee stability. So what we do is we address trunk and lower extremity in 3D. 
We used both independent and combined exercise. We used a phase-based progression. Again, this is functional progressions after they've finished their rehab. And then we progressively add degrees of freedom, volume, speed, perturbations, and we make sure that they have good control before they progress to the next phase. So again, these are all modifiable risk factors. Ligament dominance, we're gonna look at lower extremity landing, we're gonna look at foot placement, at quad dominance, we're gonna listen for excessive contact noise because they're landing straighter. Leg dominance, we're gonna make sure that the thighs are equal side to side, that their foot placement is good, that their foot contact uh, timing is equal, and we're gonna work on their trunk dominance. We're gonna do pauses between plyometric jumps and we're gonna make sure that they land with the same footprint during a plyometric and we're gonna move them towards symmetric technique perfection. And what we do again is use lateral jump progressions and we use a five phase system until they get near perfect form with these plyos. Then we do a lot of single leg because again, with single leg training you create greater symmetry and we phase that. And then we do trunk stability and hip external rotation exercises. To, to increase that hip external rotation moment and increase trunk stability and control of the core. And we do a lot of single leg lateral progressions to control that valgus moment at the knee. We do tongue jump pro progressions to increase relative ham to quad ratio and increase relative neuromuscular control. We, we enhance control in the rotary plane which tends to drop off with a graft. And we do a lot of lateral trunk progression work because we know lateral movement of the trunk and lack of hip control lead to greater risk. So we also do sagittal plane progressions. With this training, we do lateral, single leg, tuck jumps, single leg progressions. And we do this with 2D knee abduction in mind. And we do it with asymmetry. And these are all exercises you can use to increase symmetry and enhance postural stability and postural control. So again, we're going to attack these four deficits and, until those deficits are not there using very objective progressions to return to sport using this phasing algorithm. We, we start out with dynamic stabilization, functional strength and power, symmetry of sport movement, and very functional core training so that these deficits we see in athletes in single leg power and single leg control are no longer there. And we use simple plyometric tools that we have out in the literature that are easy to get a hold of to look at symmetry. And our recommendation is those athletes with excessive dynamic valgus, low hamstring strength, side-to-side -side differences in strength, coordination, balance, or poor trunk stability be screened, trained to hopefully prevent those injuries. Now we did, we did put out a book on this. I don't make a dime off this book. It, you can get it through Human Kinetics or any other major bookseller. All the proceeds from this go to ACL Injury Research, and I think it's a pretty good book. We do do an annual workshop. This year it's going to be on November 11th. It's a two-day workshop where we focus one day just on the rehabilitation of anterior cruciate reconstructed individuals, and then another day on prevention of first and second injuries. And finally, this is just for OSU Sports Medicine. I know you guys all work in sports medicine and face problems like this. We do whatever it takes to support our athletes, including the Buckeyes. So, so basically, this is, I don't know if you know who this guy is, he's Terrell Pryor. He's part, of, he's part of Tattoo Gate, right? Watch this. This is our head team position. Watch this. Boom. I love playing this when he's in the room. This is Chris Kading. He, he's the medical director for the largest varsity athletic program in the country. So that you're gonna think that the, the athletes are gonna make sure their team doc is okay, don't you? What do they do? They grab the quarterback, they're gone. What about Dr. Kading, guys? Of course, the other team docs are over here taking care of Dr. Kading, watch this. They're over here laughing at him. <laughs> the board is the other team position, making sure everything else is okay. We thank him for all his efforts. Finally, I want to say I am a non-clinician scientist, and I'm a bit of an ape when it comes to anything outside the laboratory, so that's, a, that's just a little uh, disclaimer there. And finally, with one minute left, 
I'm going to give you a little case report. I've been trying to convince you that we can pick out high-risk players and prevent injuries. So we're going to call this guy a high-risk, potentially high-risk player. How do we know that? I don't know. There are various markings here that may point him <laughs> out as a high-risk player. Now, what happens is <laughs> the high-risk player makes this high-risk maneuver. Now, we could have put blinders on him or, or maybe some sort of psychological aversion therapy, if you could imagine that. But we didn't intervene, right? We let him go ahead and make that bad biomechanical movement. Now what happens next? <laughs> He's poshed by the opposing player. Well, now Beckham is really bent. So what I'm trying to say to you is, don't turn your head the other way. Try to prevent before it's too late. And I want to thank you and a whole lot of other people for listening to me this evening. Thanks very much. Yeah, so yeah, so we're, we actually have three current grants looking at knee bracing, biofeedback braces. There's, there's not a, a lot of good data relative to knee bracing. So there was one study that was led by John Albright from Iowa that was done in the Big Ten in the early and mid-80s. What they did is they looked at that time uh, at, I won't mention company names, but it was probably the most popular uh, ACL prevention brace of that time in the early and mid 80s. The construct is, hasn't changed. It, there's less metal on them now. They're smaller and lighter, but other than that, the, the technology is very similar. What they showed in that study using all the Big Ten teams over multiple years was that those braces did not prevent ACL injuries. What they did is that when they broke it down by position, an interior lineman who get hit from the side by 300 plus pound guys and get their legs rolled, there was a, a slight tendency to decrease MCL sprains in interior linemen. That's why you still see in the NCAA the interior lineman wearing those braces. The problem is, one of the problems is when you put on a brace like that and you have that strap across the back and you tighten it up, it tends to turn down the hamstring activity. Now what we talked about is how important the hamstrings is. So again, this little guy, so this is the front of my tibia, that ACL is keeping that, that tibia from going forward relative to the femur. Now, what happens, one of the problems with being quad dominant, there's a, there's a few problems here. First. In the sagittal plane, when you're quad dominant and your knee's less than, say, 45 degrees, like during a landing, especially the initial part, usually when you land, you land between 10 and 20 degrees of knee flexion, and then you might go down to maybe 60, 65 degrees of knee flexion. So those first 40, 45 degrees, the quad, when it's activating because it's, it acts through the quad tendon, through the kneecap to the patellar tendon, what it does when it activates is it pulls that tibia forward and puts stress on the ACL. What the hamstrings does is exactly the opposite. The hamstrings is what we call an agonist or helper of the ACL. So when you're cranking down that strap, your hamstrings activity tends to go down. And what they showed is in defensive backs who are very, they have to be hamstrings dominant. You know, they're running backwards all the time. ACL risk actually went up in, in defensive backs. So there's not a lot of good evidence. So what we're doing now is, is we're looking at, well, 
there, there's several things we're looking at, but one of the studies we're looking at is we're trying to reproduce a study out of Canada. This was a post-op study, and what they did is they, they used a, a regular ACL prevention knee brace, and they used just a knee sleeve. And what they, you know, just any kind of neoprene sleeve, and what they showed was they had the exact same effect on outcomes. So it might be, it might be that it's just having that tactile sensation. So again, you're losing this major sensor in the knee joint, and maybe you know putting a, a extra sensors. In, in other words, you feel around that joint more because you've got this pressure on the, the system. They, it was basically the same whether you did it with a mechanical brace or a knee sleeve. Outcomes, in other words, failures, every outcome was exactly the same. What we're looking into is lighter braces that use less strapping and more biofeedback. In other words, using tones so when your knee falls in or your hip falls in or giving a vibratory sensation because we're going to have to do what we can to increase that proprioception and kinesthesia around that joint that's lost with loss of that, of that tissue. I should also say about quad and hamstring dominance. So we mainly think of quad dominance in the sagittal plane, but quad dominance also has a major effect in the frontal and transverse planes. Here's why. The quadriceps, big, heavy, strong muscle on the front of your thigh, the problem is it, it has a single tendon across the joint. A single tendon can't control this very well, and it certainly can't control rotation very well. Whereas a hamstring dominant individual has two tendons going into the, in the posterior lateral and medial corners of the tibia, and because there's two tendons, it can control varus valgus. In other words, if you're going to valgus, all you have to do is activate the medial hamstrings to bring that joint into alignment. And if you're going into internal rotation, all you have to do is activate the lateral hamstrings to keep it externally rotated. And here's another problem, and I don't want to get up on a soapbox here, but what is one of our most popular graphs that we use now? It's medial hamstrings graphs. And they're actually used more in girls and women than they are in guys for reasons like we don't want to enhance patellofemoral issues. But when a woman does activate her hamstrings, on average, the tendency is to activate the lateral hamstrings more and the medial hamstrings less. So you've got an individual that's already quad dominant, that's lateral hamstring dominant, that's torn her ACL probably partially for those reasons, and what are you doing? you're taking out her medial hamstrings tendons. I think biomechanically and neuromuscularly, I see a big problem with that. When I first started out in this business 20 years ago, the gold standard was patellar tendon graft, and that's what 90% of grafts were. You know what the relative ratio is to hamstrings now? It's about 60% hamstrings. In uh, Canada, it's almost 100%. In Europe, it's getting up 70, 80% because, again, those are socialized healthcare systems. Hamstrings using the endo button, which is basically a molly on the femur side, is very quick and easy and, and cheap. So we're going in that direction, but, but I have some, some serious uh, doubts about it. And there's now some epidemiologic data coming out that shows that hamstrings grafts overall stretch out more that they stretch out significantly more in women than in men, and that the idea that those hamstrings, tendons actually grow back, what grows back is scar tissue, and it's probably not functional scar tissue. It probably doesn't shorten like it did before. So I think, again, you all as healthcare professionals, as rehabilitation clinicians, need to think about what you're faced with here. You're going to be faced with hamstrings and patellar tendon, and you need to think about what deficits you're dealing with and work with what you got, because you're going to see those. What you're going to have to do is think about what strategies you're going to do to, to help compensate for those deficits so that less 
biomechanically or neuromuscularly sound compensations don't occur in the absence of good clinical care. Other questions? I had a question. Um, I was just curious, is there any association to meniscus damage and ACLs? Yes, so the, there is. So there, there, um, it's complex. So there, there's uh, what's called the terrible triad, which is, which used to, people used to think happen more than it actually does, is when you tear your ACL, you tear your medial meniscus and your MCL all together. That does happen fairly often in an ACL tear, but maybe 20, 25% of the time. So yeah, they, they are connected. The two are connected and it's basically the forces that we're talking about. So here, here, a lot of people like to say that it's just a quad activation or it's just the tibia coming forward relative to the femur that tears the ACL. That's almost certainly wrong. Yes, the tibia does come forward. It also goes into that abduction position where you're opening up that lateral joint. But what happens is if your tibia is not forward and you go into that abducted position, the MCL takes up most of the tension. Now the MCL is a bigger, more stronger, more elastic limit ligament than the ACL is. So it can even resist some of those loads. But if you have a little bit of anterior translation and then you apply that valgus, the ACL takes over as the primary resistor to that valgus load. Then, here's the kicker, <coughs> internal rotation of the tibia. When you have those three together, that's what pops an ACL. Those three motions together also tear menisci. So, yes, when they, they are connected mechanically. Other questions? Yes. Um, there are multiple ratios that we've either been taught or heard of about quad to hamstring strength. Right. What What is your quad to hamstring strength ratio, and where do you get that from? It's It's, it's highly speed dependent. Okay. So. So if um, if it's at slow speed, so traditionally, so the favorite speeds are. 60 degrees, well, there's isometric where it's not moving. There's 60 degrees per second. They tend to go in 60 degree intervals because you work from radians on these computers. So 60 degrees works out in radian terms pretty easily. 60, 120, 240, 360. And some dynamometers will go up to 400 or 420. Most of them kind of max out at six, at 360. The problem is when you most go over 360 or even at 360, it's not just a strength component anymore. There's more of a neural component. It's how fast you can move, not just how strong the, the muscle is. So the ham quad ratio is relatively low at 60 degrees per second. So it might be about 30% in a normal individual, but it keeps going up. As, so you have a relationship that's curve a linear as you're going up through your cycle. So this is how rapidly, and I've, I've got a whole talk on this actually, but it, it's how rapidly you're increasing the relative rotation of the joint versus the ham quad ratio. This is actually way back when I, I don't know if it's still, but it used to be a question on the, uh, the NASCA examination to get your, uh, get your uh, qualifier for the CSCS. The question was, what happens to the ham quad ratio as isokinetic speed goes up? The answer is, ham quad ratio goes up. Now, so the reason it said that is because, and we did a whole meta-analysis on this. I've got a, a paper that I can send you if you're interested. But if you look at all the, you have to look at gravity corrected data only. That's also important. If your dynamometer is not gravity corrected, remember gravity resists the quads and helps the hammies. So if you're not corrected, you're going to get very different ratios. So that, that's another caveat. 
But when you looked at, there were 1,800 subjects in the literature when we looked at that, and there were only about 300 of them that were female. It was mostly males. People would do this on football teams mostly over, you know, mid, mid to late 70s to mid to late 80s, dynamometry was extremely popular. Where it really dropped out, you know why? Because they quit reimbursing it in PT clinics. It was a big reason that it dropped, dropped out of, it, it still comes down to the money. But getting back to your question, so what I would say, it depends on the speed. So at 30 degrees, say 30, at, or, or at 60 degrees, say 30, at 120, it might be 40, at 240, it might be 50. If you're at relatively high speed, at 300, 300 degrees per second, which is normally where we measure, a good ratio is a minimum of two-thirds hamstring to quad. A minimum of two-thirds. If you see at that relatively high speed, they're below 50%, below half as, half as strong, you've got potential problems. But again, that's for 300 or 300 degrees per second on a gravity-corrected dynamometer. Other questions? Uh, you talk a lot about the uh, hamstring and quad ratio. What about the gastroc or even the whole tricep psori as a whole in preventing ACL injuries? Yeah, so we do a lot of what we do is very plyometrically oriented. It's sort of controversial because we do, we've started out like, we start out with simple wall jumps. So the whole idea of wall jumps is just gastroc complex. Now some people claim, the group in Vermont, um, Bruce Bainan claims that at low knee flexion angles, the, the insertion point of the, the gastroc is so far posterior that it actually, when you contract it, that it actually pushes the tibia forward. So he wouldn't, his guess is that gastroc activation wouldn't necessarily be a good thing. However, you don't have to have very many knee flexions, what, many degrees of knee flexion, say 30 degree plus, where the insertion point and the force vector goes back and you're actually pulling the tibia back like you want. So I think gastroc complex is very important. Uh, there would be those that would argue with me that it's not, but a lot of we do, a lot of what we do is gastroc complex oriented. Other questions? One in the back. Kind of a selfish question. Go have for you, it. <laughs> have you ever seen hypertrophy of the patellar tendon with an ACL tear? Hypertrophy of the patellar tendon with ACL tear. If not, we probably should talk. <laughs> <laughs> so what we do know is this. Patellar so are you talking about where they took the graft? Uh, yes, but can we make it? No, yeah, they, no, that, it, that happens. It, it does happen. So, so what you do with a patellar tendon graft is it's called a bone patellar tendon bone construct. So what you, what you have there is you take the inferior pole of the patella, you take the middle third of the patellar tendon, then you go out to that tibial tubercle and you basically transversely cut it in half and you pull that out. Now what they normally try to do is fill that with something. Usually it's like the junk left over from the surgery. They'll, you know, where, where from the, the sawing and the, they'll try to pack that in there. What happens is just like with the hamstrings is you actually get hypertrophic overgrowth of the tissue fairly often. So that wouldn't be crazy to think that you would get hypertrophic growth. The problem is that's not the same type of tissue. So what you're, the difference is what you want in there is type 2 collagen. What you're getting is type 1 collagen. Type 1 collagen is scar. And that's what you get along the hamstrings as well. So yeah, it's not, that's not, and they'll show, like the Japanese have ha always had this thing that you can take the hamstrings, no worries about it, because it all grows back. 
And it actually, when they show pictures of it growing back, it's always thicker, actually, when they show these sonograms or MRIs, the tissue's actually thicker. That's because it's scar tissue overgrowth. And it's not functional in the same way. It certainly doesn't have the same material elastomeric properties. And we can talk more if you want to. I'm going to actually ask one question that relates um, a little bit to, I couldn't help myself, relates a little bit to uh, this discussion you just, we had about isokinetics. Um, you're right, in the, in the, the early to, to mid 80s when I was a, a cl an active clinician, <coughs> isokinetic testing was the gold standard. And, and yep. the reason I'm saying this to all of you in the room is that, uh, you know, from the work that you're doing now and your research and others, it seems to me as though some of the tests you're talking about today are tests that these folks, future clinicians, are going to be really responsible for administering per the physician's orders to make sure somebody's ready to go back after an ACL reconstruction. I mean, right. I had to be very well versed in isokinetic dynamometry evaluation to make sure that when a physician sent an athlete to me, I could not only administer the test, but read it and analyze it to say, yes, so-and-so is ready to go back to play. So are you saying, in, your, in, in an ideal situation, you think there will be a set of four or five different objective functional measurements, yes. screening measurements that will be down the road, the gold standard for these folks? I, I, do, I do think so. So this is, this is our prediction algorithm without any injury. So this is a primary ACL rupture. Here's what you'll see is, is um, oh, this is for patellofemoral. It did. OK, so here. You, you see these relative, you see the lengths of these going into the nomogram? The length of that is directly proportional to its weight in the prediction algorithm. See the relative weight of the quad ham ratio? It's not, it, it's not a huge player here. And if you look at, if you look at secondary, it, it is a potential predictor. It does feed into the equation, but if you look at, um, the relative prediction for this asymmetries in quad ham. This wasn't done with a dynamometer. It was done with inverse dynamics, but same kind of idea. So it's a player in, so it's a player in both primary and secondary risk prediction, but it's, in this one, in secondary, it's more of a player than it is in primary. But it's not, I mean, it's almost equal to valgus knee kinematics, but it doesn't even come close to so it, it, it does play a role here. Again, the problem is because insurance companies decided about 15 years ago that they were no longer going to reimburse for it. So what you do, though, the, the way you sell it to your hospital to buy one is you say, I can still build tests and measures on it. That's the, that's the way you do it. But the tests and measures billing, so in other words, you're billing for the PT time. You're not actually billing for that specific test it at a higher rate. Other questions? Uh, back to the hamstring graft and the decrease in the strength. If someone has a hamstring graft, can we help them strengthen it so that it's useful again, I, or I is it think, too damaged? I think you have to. And can you do it? We, I, I have this, uh, I can tell you I should probably keep my mouth shut because when I give this talk in Canada or Japan or even when I'm going to be in Switzerland next week, uh, I get absolutely attacked when I say these things. So take this with a grain of salt. The surgeons who have gone from bone, patellar tendon bone to hamstring will, will tell you I am absolutely FOS. You know, I mean, so, so, and I am not a clinician. I mean, you have to... But I think there are things you can do, which is what you, what you need to do is make someone more hamstring dominant. They still have most of that muscle tissue there. The problem is with the tendons themselves are now more scar tissue. And they don't, ultrasound shows that they don't move in a syncytium within the sheath like a normal tendon does. It, it's sort of there. But the muscle's still there and can be activated. But I think you need to focus more on the hamstrings. The other, the other problem, as I said, is especially with women, 
they tend to turn on lateral hamstrings more. Now, what happens when, you, when you're a lateral hamstring dominant person? You're closing down the lateral compartment and opening up the medial. You're creating that valgus. So you can do different techniques to teach them to use their, their, their I say turn on the whole complex more and turn on the medial hamstrings more. But even so, what we're talking about is mainly position of the femur. And you can do a lot of that working up here proximally. The problem is you can't, what the hamstrings give you on that medial side is control of, of rotation of the tibia relative femur, and you really can't work that up here. You have to work it down there. So I would suggest what you don't want is that femur internally rotating. So I would suggest you work rotational exercises to enhance especially lateral side activation to keep their tibia from rolling in. But there's a lot of different work you can do to help someone compensate for loss of sensation or scar tissue in that joint. A lot of it is just about feeling and proprioception. Sometimes just a simple thing like putting on a knee sleeve can make some difference. Other questions? Well, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it.